I'm not quite sure where Rustless came from, but I always adored Fred Emney, and I think, I think it may be from him. That's for complimentary, of course. This is for the, uh, you know, the, the knockers. How are you doing? How are the things you're in? What? I haven't bloody well started yet. <laughs> it was his sort of attitude of waiting and watching the world go by, really, that I thought was funny, which Rustless did. He sort of used to stand back and see all these things happening. Nothing much happened to him. The Bates, uh, did you get much of it out east? Uh, Indian food. <laughs> Indian food. Oh, yes, my lord. Yeah. We used to eat it out in the moonlight with the crickets singing. Crickets singing? What do you mean, the second eleven having a knees up behind the pavilion? <laughs> no, 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 my lord, the insect. Yeah, yeah. Like a grasshopper. Oh. We used to catch them sometimes just to hear them chirp. <laughs> it's done by rubbing the legs together. Yeah, really? <laughs> I was hopelessly in love, the secretary, with him. Hopelessly. She knew it was hopeless. And he treated me like a man the whole time. Come along, chap. Come along, old chap. Bates, old chap, where are you? But, I mean, she'd do anything for him. She was just a wistful, pathetic thing, you know, just adored him. <laughs> this is an old film that Bates discovered a couple of weeks ago whilst rummaging through her trunks in the attic. Have uh, you uh, got something to say about it, Bates, have you? Uh, yes, it, it wasn't in frightfully good condition, actually. Oh, uh, was it? No, uh, my lord. So I, I managed to patch it up with some odd scraps of other film I found at the bottom of the box. <laughs> I did a teeny bit of splicing. All right, Bates, <laughs> don't hog it. <laughs> played a character in one of his films called Abdul the Filthy, where he was a sheikh, I seem to remember, and he was constantly eating um, bananas, and he was throwing the bananas in front of him, and I was playing this Abdul the Filthy character, he was trying to sell him women, I think, and constantly kept slipping on the banana skin, so my entire first uh, sketch of Ronnie Barker was uh, falling on my arse. I can remember Ronnie saying then, He's going to give us all work when we get old and crotchety. David will be at the top, and he will be employing all of us. So he got it right. I mean, he could see the potential David had and how good he was. <laughs> he was very funny. Come on, Dithers, you're not eating it, man. <coughs> I'd rather get a brook than a whole mug of luck. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry. The Queen, God bless her. <laughs> Ronnie wanted to play Divers himself. I mean, that was the truth of the matter. And like, you deny it, I know, Will. He was so precise about how he visualised the character. He was a hundred-year-old gardener, so that is what I had to make up. When we were doing the makeup, Ronnie was there saying, no, 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 he's got to have more hair, more hair. His eyebrows have got to come out like this. He's got to have... I said, can he have a wart on the end of his nose? He said, I love the wart. Do give him a wart on the end of his nose. So it was really Ronnie's baby, if you like. Well, you've got the letter. There's well, I've got another. I've got that. Yes, I want to get one for the plank. Yeah. That's it. Oh, 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 oh. Beach, hold the bottom of the ladder for him, would you? Yes, I mean, I don't mind him breaking his own neck, but he might pull me down with him. Yes, I That's it. Up we go. Bates, what does it look like from your angle? Yes, lovely, my lord. Yes, well, let's mark that. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right, you last thing. Go. I got that. Looking at it afterwards, I could tell that I was very much near near breaking up. Uh, and all we have to do now is simply uh, put a bottle uh, on the end like that, and there you have it, don't you? Now, uh, how does that strike you? <laughs> it was great fun. You've got to fall in your ass with somebody. I mean, you know, Ronnie couldn't have a better, a better man to do it for. Hey, he said that. <laughs> Where? Where? <laughs> in the cage, he said that. He's a, he's a racing pigeon. Oh, gee. He's, he's a duck. No, he's got web feet unless you bought a pair of flippers, have you? It was a new concept in the sense that uh, 
what it essentially did, and I don't know if anybody thought it through in quite this detail, but what you did was to take a comic actor, and as it turned out, critically a comic writer, uh, and a much more traditional variety comedian in Ronnie Corbett, and put them together. Uh, and that gave you incredible range and breadth, and that's really what drove the construction of the show. So you had a bigger variety of elements than you'd normally had with just comedy. Has he got a name, has he? Yeah. <laughs> Donald. <laughs> We did 12 series, but we were never really a double act as such. We were never a Morgan and Wise, a straight man and a, a comic, because we each, we were quite careful each to have a funny part in one sketch and, a, and feeding the other one in another. We did that all the time, so we kept as equal as we could. <laughs> he speaks in tones both moribund and wise. <laughs> we knew enough about ourselves, because we've been in the business long enough, to know that there's this curious chemistry absent first between us, um, and very, very much present in Eric and Ernie, for example, that we could not talk to each other as people in front of the audience, in front of the public. We had no... We were connected in as much as we were friends and we enjoyed each, watching each other work and we laughed with each other, but we had no blether between us that the audience could share. They cut the cameras on a close-up of me uh, doing my line. As immediately I finished the line, they cut to Ronnie Corbett while the audience were laughing and he was reacting. And, of course, you caught us then actually laughing at the other one's jokes. In the High Court today, a man complained of a noise made by an amorous couple in the flat above. Each evening, they'd sing the red flag, then eat supper and have fun on the sofa and take a very naughty bath together. So every night, it was hammer and sickle, cheese and pickle, slap and tickle and bubble and squeak. If either of us didn't like a joke, it was out. It was certainly out. You know, if I loved a joke and Ronnie said, I don't like that, it would be out. Without question. No, you didn't have to give a reason. It was out. And that worked a treat. And same with sketches. We've got murky water, dirty water, squirty water, old water, cold water, gold water, plain water, rain water, water on the rocks, water on the knee, water on the bridge. Which would you like? <laughs> he was always very interested in the directing and the construction of the show and, and subsequently even of the editing and he would come to the edit and so on. And that never really interested Ronnie C, although Ronnie C absolutely trusted his judgment, you know, so it actually worked very well because it wasn't that Ronnie C felt competitive about it. He, he, he didn't want to know. That's, if Ronnie wanted to know, that was great because then there was somebody doing it who he knew would look out for the best interests of the team. You had to separate the performer and the writer. It's interesting that he did separate it himself, that this Gerald Wiley character who he invented for himself, I don't know why, I would guess that... If you're in a show and you write stuff and you say Ronnie Barker at the end of the script, then the director either thinks we must have it in because it's by Ronnie or we mustn't have it in because it's by Ronnie. Whereas if you send it in under somebody else's name, it gets judged along with all the rest of the stuff. Everything I wrote, I always wrote under a pseudonym because I don't like the sort of Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles syndrome, you know, with your name on at least four times, you know, once is enough. Tickle your body with a feather tonight. I beg your pardon. Is <laughs> it particularly grotty weather tonight? Oh, yes. <laughs> I say, that sweater looks a little risky. Pardon? I say, I'd better have a little whiskey. Someone asked me recently to, uh, to publish all the scripts I ever wrote. Uh, and I thought, that would be great, because I won't have to keep that room full of uh, tatty old things. I can keep it all in a book. But I didn't realise how big, big the book was going to be. It's, uh, it's about 800 pages. Mustn't get hiccups or they'll fall out. What did you say? I just heard the cricket score. They're all out. <laughs> it is sheer fun, isn't it? Nobody could take any exception to it, uh, partly because all the innuendo is watered down for us, but it is this sheer joy in playing with a language that no other country's got. Soya dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a better idea. Me have another peak. <laughs> that one called Pekin Duck. You got a lot of letters uh, with this would make a funny sketch for your show, and of course it never did, it never did. And then one day I got a letter from someone in Hayes, I think it was, um, who said you ought to write a, a sketch about our hardware shop because we have some funny. P someone came in the other day and asked for four candles as I thought. I gave him these four candles. I took two out of the box of six, gave him the four, and he said, No, oh, four candles. <laughs> candles for forks. 
And another man came in and wanted hose. You got any hose? No hose. <laughs> Hose? What a... Oh, you mean pantyhose? Pantyhose? No, no, hose, hose, hose for a gate. Mon repose, hose. I find the English language very funny. It's very... It's very ambiguous. You can say things and not mean what you say at all. And you, lots of things. I mean, the joke about the mother who says, Johnny, go across the road and see how old Mrs Jones is. She hasn't been well, in brackets. Doesn't say that. And the little boy goes and comes back and says, Mrs. Jones said, it's nothing to do with you how old I am. Now, you see, that's simply because how old Mrs. Jones is. How old Mrs. Jones is, or how old Mrs. Jones is. It's, that that all, has always fascinated me, that sort of mix-up. And it, it happens ten times a day, actually. The key to the whole thing, really, is having a, a diversion sign in your brain so that when anything comes in and says, I was going to go this way, suddenly it makes this big yellow sign saying diversion. And all the ideas have to go off down lots of side streets before eventually being led back onto the main road. And so things like in the memory sketch, where he ties a knot in his handkerchief. How does it work? Well, the knot reminds me of the Boy Scouts, which reminds me of the Brownies, which reminds me of Doreen Adelson, which reminds me of Knockers, which reminds me of Knickers. Uh, knickers, Twickers, Twickers, Rugger, Rugger, Cricket, Cricket, Allen, Knot, and that reminds me of the knot in my handkerchief. <laughs> A lot of the trick of the daft material is that it's delivered to the camera by authority figures, isn't it? It's delivered by official spokesmen, people who are slightly pompous, and, or quite often people who are not quite sure of what they're doing, so add to the pomposity to make it more effective, which, of course, makes it funnier. I'd always loved these strange characters. There was a one character called Milton Hayes. I used to hear him on 78 Records. He was extraordinary. He wrote things like... Um, uh, now, what we've got to do is to, is to all get together and, and st stand behind ourselves and, and push ourselves along and, and uh, make the country what it was in the yeah, days yeah, that to, uh, used to be. Much Today, in, in Britain, now, in, in 1966, 20%, uh, or to put it another way, uh, five out of every hundred, <laughs> or to look at it in simple terms, uh, 2.5 in every 44.7, uh, <laughs> as against 3% uh, of the entire population of Britain for the same period from 1945 until last year. first joke I ever made, I, think, I can remember, was in school, and I was about eight, and there was a boy called Michael Thornton who was um, trying to remember a poem which he was supposed to have learnt, uh, and he's, he was about a windmill. And he said, the great sails cut through the air, cut through the air, great sails cut through the air. And I said, he'll be bald in a minute if it goes on cutting. And that little eight-year-old voice piped up and made the class laugh. Didn't make the, the master laugh at all. <laughs> if only he'd known, you see. That was just a little joke. When I started writing, I... I really hated it, actually. I loved, if it went well, I loved the result. And I was very satisfied and very pleased that it went well. But the actual physical thing of getting it onto paper, I used to find very painful and very tiring. Um, but I used to go in at nine o'clock into the room, and as the old story, you know, with a blank sheet of paper and a pen, and try and come out at five o'clock with something performable. And mostly I did. In fact, some of the musical items I wrote in a day, um, it was fun. I love, I love writing lyrics, of course. That's my favourite uh, writing. I think it says in Who's Who, he his hobbies are collecting postcards and writing song lyrics. I haven't written any for years, but I leave it in there. <laughs> I don't know why. Somebody asked it. Somebody asked it. Somebody asked it. Nobody wants a mucky job, but someone must go through it. Somebody's got to lift it, shovel it up and chip it. Sweep it and scrape it, squash it and shape it, kick it around and try to get rid of me. And Mrs. Inginbottom love it when we get put on these orchestra jobs. My first husband used to play the organ, so I've always quite liked twiddling. No. <laughs> I can claim no musical connections, though I used to have an uncle in the woodwind. Oh. But he would eat radishes for supper and was consequently not a very good win. Now take the Queen. Although the work she has to do is nice and clean, it must be tiring being on the public scene. And looking fresh as paint no matter where she's been, and still serene. 